I'm Tommy Salmons. This is Year Zero. The show that revolutionizes personal engagement in the world and fortification of your life. Let's get to it. We're brought to you by Fox and Sons. Foxandsons.com, the best place to get your BBC. I never start my day with anything less than BBC in my mouth. And I suggest if you like BBC, you go to foxandsons.com. Get that big, bold coffee and put it in your mouth. Foxandsons.com. Promo code zero at checkout for 18% off on any order, $25 or more. That's foxandsons.com for that BBC big, bold coffee. Put it in your mouth, baby. And the Mark Clare Show. If you enjoyed Mark Clare with Lions of Liberty, you're going to really dig the Mark Clare Show. Mark Clare has gone beyond the realm of politics to dig into the esoteric meaning of life in all sorts of different avenues, whether it be entrepreneurship, ghosts, goblins, Bigfoot, um, demonic entities, religion. Mark Clare is diving into all of it, and he's not afraid to tackle any task. So go check out the Mark Clare Show. Thank you, as always, Tom Burton, for the music. And you can find this show and many more at the Libertarian Institute.org. That's the Libertarian Institute.org. That's where you'll find me, Patrick McFarlane, Scott Horton, Keith Knight, Will Porter, Kyle Anzalone, and a host of other writers like Kim Robinson. Go to the Libertarian Institute.org and keep track of everything that we are doing for you. All right, I am here with Mr. Matthew Erickson. What's up, buddy? How's it going? I have agreed to allow you to record me because yeah. I trust you, Tommy. <laughs> that was your first mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll bite me in the ass someday, but One it's, it's worked days. out for me so far. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think you've been on this show since we, uh, you and I, and Cooper recorded that uh, episode on myth. Like, what was that? Oh, Two yeah. years ago. Yeah, that was, I think that was while I was still in California, wasn't it? I think so. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That was, was a long couple, time ago. It, like it might have been right after I moved here. I've been here my, two years now. Might have been, but it was like two years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's the last, last, the last time we, uh, we talked and Cooper always tells me, he's like, Hey, if Matt ever wants to do another show with me again, I'd love to talk to him again. And I'm like, all right. Yeah. I was like, he's a busy dude, man. It's hard to nail Matt down for anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, totally. And then for those who are who are more familiar uh, with me now, I guess um, uh, there's a Cooper, my co-host, and, and Tommy is talking about a different Cooper. Um, yeah, I'm talking J his. Jason Cooper. We call him Coop, but yeah, yeah, Jason yeah, Cooper. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would be. I would. I would love to talk to him again. He, uh, that guy, especially now after. Um, I think he was. It was kind of jarring to talk to him at the time because. Yeah, he he kind of broke my frame, and uh, and so I was just like trying to take on what he was saying, and I was like, dude, this guy, I need to, I need to, I need to read more to be able to hold my own in a conversation with this guy, and uh, and now I think I've I've, I guess I've kind of been letting some of the sorts of ideas that we talked about with him, they've been percolating in my mind a lot mm -hmm. more over the past few years. So um, I'd love to come back and reconnect with him and and kind of pick up where we left off and see see what's happened in the last few years. Yeah, we'll have to do that. Uh, he's funny man because like i will like i don't i haven't heard from him in like two weeks but i guarantee you it's going to be like tomorrow he's going uh -huh. to he's going to text me like this novel <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's going to be everything he's been thinking of for the last couple of weeks since we spoke last <laughs> and uh yeah no he's he's awesome and and every time he does that i it's i get it because he's in canada so i get it first thing in the morning and i see it at like five o'clock in the morning and i'm like 
I'm gonna have to come back to this. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just, I just can't. <laughs> like, I don't. Yeah, know. I don't have. I don't have the cognitive brain power first thing in the morning to, uh, yeah, I, to keep I've, up with them. I've only had one cup of coffee, man. I can't do this yet. <laughs> 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 but he's he's an awesome guy, man. I love mm-hmm. I love him. All right. Well, um, you've been on this. Uh, you you've become the PayPal mafia guy a, a <laughs> yeah. lot a lot in, in, in very similar fashion to the way I became the ESG guy. And yeah, the one thing I wanted to do is 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 I wanted to chat with you about it because I find it very interesting what you're what you're observing. And uh, but one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of get you down different roads where we're not talking about the same thing. Cause that was the one thing about ESG that drove me crazy is I was just repeating myself constantly. Uh huh. It was like, I've answered this question 5,000 times, man. You can go listen to the last podcast I was on and I gave the answer, you know? So, <laughs> so let's, I want to try to move you in different ways and try to connect different dots if we can. Yeah. If I'm, we can see some different stuff. So one of the things I told you coming into this podcast is that I noticed that you, prior to stumbling onto the PayPal Mafia idea, is you were doing this series on the generations, on on boomers, millennials, Gen X, and Gen Z. So can you give us a little crash course on what that is? Yeah, yeah. So this was this was the kind of the thing that actually ultimately led me to the the among another number of things led me to the the PayPal mafia uh, observations, I guess. And so it's probably important. Um, this this was my mental framing as I was starting to dig into this and uncover this stuff. So it's probably valuable to, to look through this lens. Um, so so there's kind of the, like the history of the West really begins. The history of the modern West really begins with World War II. That's the that's the founding myth. Um, for for this kind of the reigning ideology of the last basically since World War II, the this thing that I've termed naive boomer idealism. Um and it's I think I, I tried to I tried to it was sort of the sort of the term that just came to mind. And I think it it it's one of the terms that really captures it captures the essence of the thing when you hear it specific. So like the naive, the naivety, the boomer ideology, um, and the the very idealistic kind of like we're at the end of history. Um, we've accomplished everything there is to com- to accomplish. We're the, the you know the greatest. We, you know, we, we've ascended to the pinnacle of humanity. Now we've completed all our big world wars, and we're entering into this age of of endless peace and prosperity that's going to continue on and on and on. And and all bad and evil things have have been struck from the earth. Um, so part and parcel of that is that when there are bad and evil things, uh, we have been conditioned to treat them in really bizarre ways. We don't actually confront them. We don't actually manage them well. We don't like on a civilizational level. We're losing all of the traditions that that brought us to this point. That actually is like a tradition is like a like a encoded civilizational memory at the at the the societal level. Um, so I really, it's kind of like you can talk about history before World War II, but if you really want to understand the psychology of everybody now, world war two is such a significant cutoff point that it's almost like the history before that is a history of a different people. And the history since then has been the, this naive boomer idealism. So as I was, there's all these different kind of memes about the generations for a long time with millennials. It's like, they're the participation trophy generation. They're, um, they're soft. They're, you know, they just, uh, uh, they're ruled by their feelings. They're uh, an entitled generation, spoiled brats, that sort of thing. Uh, Gen X kind of has always had the 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 reputation for being more uh, renegade, punk, uh, uh, rebellious, individualistic, um, sort of run naturally runs orthogonally to uh, the rest of society. Um, kind of sees themselves as like the outcast or the misfit. These are all sorts of trends that have have there there a variety of different memes that have popped up with with Gen X. And then obviously the boomers you have there's a very clear boomer um uh, meme at this point. And it's it, one of the funny things about the boomer meme is that th- the people to whom it applies to the most can't see it. it. It doesn't even exist to them. If you try to convince a boomer that they're a boomer, it it's it's like uh, you're trying to teach Latin to a dog or something. And it's not that they're stupid, it's that this is how deeply enculturated they are in their um, generational frame, their generational mentality. 
um, because they're the ones who who they were born at the beginning of history. This is this is this is the way the world is. This is the way it's always ever ever been. And we we kind of just take this all for granted. Mm. And um, everything is light and airy and sunshiny and. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, every, every number goes up always and forever and society is, is structured just, you know, we just, we have all these perfect mechanisms that we've developed and we just need to make sure we stick to all of them. And, you know, if you go through the process and you do the things to, to earn your way into society, then you're going to, you're, you know, you're going to experience the benefit of that. You know, like if you're going to get a job, just, just t- take your resume, write it down, print it off, um, go down to the McDonald's and, and um, ask to speak to the manager, shake his hand, look him in the eye. Hand him your re- hand him your resume and and you know you'll get a good job and then you can you can pay your way through college and then buy your first house and just you know but it's like we haven't lived in this world for at least twenty years at I'm, a minimum. I'm, I'm sitting here as a Gen Xer, right? My parents are late stage boomers, mm-hmm. so sixty one, sixty two. I'm late stage Gen X, seventy nine. Yeah, right. All right. Yep. And I'm sitting here as you're saying this, and I'm like. Fuck your diploma. Fuck your colleges. Fuck your, you know, resumes. Fuck that shit. And it reminds me of, of that Elon Musk interview where he's like, "Go fuck yourself." Yeah, I'm like, yeah, that's our yes. mentality. He's like, go fuck yourself. We're gonna figure out our own way. We're gonna do it our way. Yes, like the the I think that the the art that best captures the Gen X spirit is basically any John Hughes movie. That like mm. um uh pretty in pink uh breakfast club breakfast club um, yeah <laughs> all of that like that's or or other ones would be like uh uh back to the future is a similar one the goonies is another these are movies that are really um uh they're like they're like i just uh, saw a t-shirt in a truck stop today it was a goonies t-shirt i was like oh i should buy that <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah so i was born in 88 and i was raised by young parents who had even younger siblings so they were all like pure children of of gen x Mm. so i'm i'm very squarely in the millennial approximate birth bracket um but i'm very heavily influenced by gen x but you're Um, bringing up all these movies you know the you know the one movie like you don't name but it was like probably the most influent influential movie on me growing up was the outsiders mm, okay yeah Yeah. i mean yeah i mean look at the cast of characters that's in that movie i mean you had emilio estevez uh, Matt Dillon was in there, uh, you know, Ralph Macchio. Like, that was a great movie. Yeah. Karate yeah. Kid. There's another great. Karate another Kid was another. Gen X. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, and you, and then you also have the punk phenomenon. Now, what's interesting is the people who were creating that art, the people who were funding it, producing it, acting in it, all of those people were at least boomers, if not older, mm-hmm. which is kind of interesting. So, you, you, the, the spirit of a generation, the spirit that characterizes a generation, is actually cultivated by the 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 worldview and the behavior of the earlier generations. So mm-hmm. boomers were the ones who created the Gen X media, and the Gen X generation has embodied that media. So the it, there's a there's like a generational transfer or inter, or interaction or relationship here. And you can see this. So so you and there's there's kind of like a TikTok to it almost where. Gen X was like was like the generation that rebelled against their parents. There's a lot of reasons for this too. The fourth turning goes into this just in some detail, and um, it, essentially, if you just think about it, like you have the, the 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 boomer person who grows up as a boomer, they you know as they're as they're when they're either very young or just entering into adolescence, you have um, America lands a, a man on the moon, and you have all of this national pride. You have um, massive economic expansion, which is, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. The fallout from World War II and being, and, and basically um, American interests, rebuilding Europe and uh, extending the American empire, all these things. America w- were the Americans were the beneficiaries of this sudden influx of massive wealth and growth. Mm. And then there's the geographic and other cultural influences throughout um, the U S continent that affect our, um, our economic uh, sustainability and uh, and our ability to defend our borders, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what do you? So this is the world that the the boomers grew up in, and Gen X found themselves not being able to participate, not being able to live in the world that they'd been trained to believe existed. Mm. I was just going to ask, why do you think there's such? Because you're talking about the overlap and like kind of the passing on of the torch in, in a way. Why do you think there's such a a chasm between Gen X and millennials. 
Mm. Okay. So this is, this is good. So this is, you have the relationship from, from the boomers to Gen X where Gen X, a lot of them were latchkey kids. They grew mm. up as latchkey kids. So yeah. they have this feeling. They were the first generation that really experienced women predominantly entering the workforce, which is connect, connected to the latchkey kid phenomenon. So they're the ones who were much more like, we're the ones who raised ourselves. Mm -hmm. Additionally, as they were growing up, like the, the 60s, 70s, 80s period, you had this big outbreak of, um, of serial killers that um, affected the national psychology significantly. You also have the Vietnam War. Entering into the 80s, you start having a lot of the 70s and the 80s, you start having a lot of um, um, economic uh, unrest associated with a variety of different things. But so the, the, the growing up experience of the Gen X person was darker than the uh, than the the boomers. The boomers were this time of of never ending growth and optimism and great national unity and pride and all this sort of thing. And Gen X was much more like, okay, we've crested and now we're sort of eh. There's, you're starting to see a departure happening between the experience of the boomers and the experience of Gen X. The millennials come on come along as the children largely of either young boomers or old Gen Xers. And there's kind of little micro generations in this as well. One of the guys in the King Pill uh, Discord uh, put this, broke it all down onto an amazing spreadsheet where he breaks out all the micro generations and their characteristics and the major historical events that shape their experience and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so uh, the millennials then were like a reaction. So the, and Gen X was like a reaction to the boomers. Millennials were kind of a reaction to Gen X. So you get the introduction of like the helicopter parenting phenomenon. Mm. Gen X parents felt like they'd been cut loose and, and left to fend for themselves. So the reaction to that was, um, we're going to, we don't want to feel, a, we don't want our children to feel abandoned the way we did. So we're going to um, more proactively parent our children, hmm. um, which then you get the, and also the, con the, the, the um, downstream effects of the whole serial killer uh, uh, phenomenon that happened in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, especially, um, and the the proliferation of global mass media and television and radio, and all of a sudden we're becoming much more interconnected, much more aware of of of, of various cultures and news events and all this sort of thing. Right. The reaction to that was more of a uh, um, millennials grew up in kind of an artificial environment in a lot of the same way that the boomers did. So the millennials are almost like an echo boomer. Um, this is the term that that Brody used in the the spreadsheet he put on the Kingpill Discord. Mm. Um, so the millennials were raised uh, to they were raised believing they lived in the world that the boomers were um, raised to live in. So the Gen Xers were much more cynical about it because of the the unrest of the seventies and eighties, especially. The millennials came on the scene on the heels of Ronald Reagan and, and another big rise in national pride and optimism. And then you have the whole dot com uh, uh, boom throughout the 90s. But then as the millennials, as they're coming up, they kind of have this, this split experience because millennial is usually like 83 or 84 to 96 or 97, approximately in that range. Mm -hmm. So for the younger, for the older millennials, I remember very much the spirit of the 90s. I remember growing up through the um, being aware, even as a, like elementary school, junior high kind of being aware of the dot com bubble and and that bursting and all of this. So experiencing like the optimism and prosperity of the 90s. But then as you're coming of age, you get the 2000s, you get 9-11, you get the uh, the introduction of social media, you get the the financial collapse and everything. So the millennials kind of were born into two separate worlds. They, they grew up, they had one world they experienced as children, but then another world that they've had to adapt to as adults. Hmm. And they were the last generation that really um, fell prey hook, line and sinker to the uh, uh, go to college, get a degree, take on a bunch of debt because you're going to get a job and you'll be able to pay it all off and, you know, um, get a 401k and contribute to it your whole life and, you know, retire on it. Like, the millennials were the last generation that grew up believing that wholesale. Mm. That vision was dying as the millennials were coming of age. But they, many of them, myself included, were already basically pot committed on the college route and had already taken on a ton of debt. Mm. Um, and so then the youngest or the oldest millennials are the ones who were basically right at the get out of college, 
buy a house, make all these major adult decisions. They were about that age when the financial, the great financial collapse happened okay. in 2008, 2009, the housing yeah. crisis. Yeah. Um, so that's made, that's left the millennial generation as it's a, there's a, a big split personality phenomenon within it, I think, because you have the, the older millennials and the younger millennials are both millennials, but they grew up in such different circumstances because of how rapidly things began to change from the late nineties to 2010 or so. And then as they're coming of age in the social media era, they're the first ones who are really affected by that. And so they all spin off into their own little circles. Whereas those circles that the millennials siphoned off into were created largely by Gen X people. Cause the Gen X generation was, were the ones who, um, like basically all the major social media companies and all the major big tech companies were founded by and are still controlled by Gen X people. They're largely funded by boomers, but founded by and controlled by uh, Gen X. So then you get the Zoomer generation. And, and in the same way that you started with the boomers and then you kind of, you, 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 you tick over to, the, to Gen X, you talk back to the millennials, you tick back to the Zoomers. This was the thing that really um, uh, pulled this whole thing into stark relief for me was talking to to my, my co-host Cooper mm -hmm. about this. And he's a Zoomer. He's a he's a very early Zoomer born in 1997. Okay. Um, so he and he, he has Boomer parents. So I'm an early millennial with Gen X parents. He's an early Zoomer with Boomer parents. So both of us kind of have been able to I, I think these these uh, four differentiations are probably clearer that to us than to the average person um which is kind of what has enabled us we are just sitting and talking on the phone we were like looking at the way we view the world how um the world we grew up in how rapidly it's been changing and the effects of technology on that to where like the generational gaps are getting narrower and narrower the boomers is like 1945 to um, 1963, typically somewhere in there. It's around 18, maybe 1965, around 18 to 20 years. Some people even push it as far as 68. Um, so you've got basically an 18 to 20 year window for the boomers. Mm -hmm. Gen X then is going to be like uh, 1965 to 1968, somewhere in there to like 1981, 1983. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's more like 16 to 18 years, maybe. Right. Then um, the millennials is like, 83-ish to 97-ish. So we're only 14 years. The Zoomers is probably something like, I don't know, 97 to 2008. It's like an, maybe 10 or 11 years. And what's happening now is that each new generation, like is, the, I think the generational frequency is is Short narrowing name. really rapidly. Because to where now, of the, how quickly things are changing. Yes. You know? Think about the experience of, um, my son was born at the end of 2020, so he's three and a half. Think about the difference in experience that he's had, the effects on his life, even epigenetic effects on his life, versus someone who's born right now. Mm. There's only a four year difference, but there's going to be a very, um, there's going to, he's going to have a, they're going to have distinct experiential differences. Right. Um, and even more so if you go from like uh, mm. 2017 to 2021, like those right. are going to be drastic. Um, so there well, here's, are, uh, here's what I find funny about this, because like you, you mentioned at, uh, before that, that like Gen Gen Z and Gen X are both cynical. Like mm -hmm. they have this like cynicism and they kind of shapes like their humor, their music, the way that they view the world, the way they interact with the world. And I kind of made the joke to you. I was like, yeah, so like Gen Z is basically like a, a cheap ripoff of Gen X with really bad music, you know? And because I remember looking at like the differences, I, I my dad and I are very big music fans. And so one of the things we look at a lot are like where music changed a lot. Mm -hmm. And so you see this like in the late sixties and into the seventies, there was a drastic change in music right mm -hmm. and then you see it again in the 90s with the like the grunge era like the late 80s into the 90s you had the grunge era you had nirvana alice in chains pearl jam this the bands i grew up they were popular when i was in high school even even when i was in high school like 
Corn came out, Marilyn Manson, and this was all darker kind of, you know, and now it's like, and then, then you hit the millennial stage and it was all like hip hop and R and B. And you're like, what is wrong with these kids? What the hell are they listening to? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like what, what is Skrillex? Like, get rid of this. I don't know what you're listening <laughs> to, you know, but I, yeah. I see, I see with my kids, like my, my oldest son was born in 98 and, uh, and so I have a 98, 2000, 2001, and then you had 2005, 2006. So, so Aiden, the one you met, he was born in 2006. He's, he's my youngest. Okay. And I actually sent him, I don't, have you seen the, the death to the world video that the kind of mm -hmm. long, all right. So basically what they did is they, they did a, a YouTube video of the first ever death to the world zine that was ever released. Oh, okay. Okay. And zines was like my, my, yeah. Era, right. Yep. And so I sent it to my, I sent it to Aiden and I was like, do you have, do y'all relate to this? And this was after hearing you like talk this subject with Buck. I was like, are there, are there people in your generation that would relate to this? And I sent, so I sent it to him and he was like, oh, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. The kind of darker visuals and just that, that idea. And I was like, man, that's really interesting. That's a really interesting, y'all stumbled onto something very interesting, observing something extremely interesting about um the way these generations interact with each other yeah yeah the the in the way that the millennials are an echo of the boomers the zoomers are kind of an echo of gen x and they have that uh um i think what what with gen x was probably cynicism with the zoomers is more full-blown nihilism but they're kind of a continuation on that that same trajectory where mm -hmm. they've grown up like a, a zoomer has grown up in absolute clown world Think about the sorts of events oh, yeah. they've experienced. If you were born in 1997, that means like your earliest memories are right around 9-11. Uh, uh, and then as you're kind of starting to get to the point, maybe you're going to like earn an allowance or start to, um, you know, think about starting your own little little side hustle like mowing lawns or lemonade stand or that sort of thing. That's the, the great financial collapse. Then right on the heels of, and then you get like Obama being elected and all the race war stuff really starting to kick off. While you also have the Patriot Act stuff, and then you get the the later term, later end of, of Obama's term, you get uh, uh, Trayvon Martin, and then you get uh, Ferguson, and then the Trump thing, and then like it's just so it's been just crazy world for them their entire life. To them, if you if you talk about these different institutions and you talk about like our democracy mm -hmm. and all these sorts of things, these are completely meaningless terms. This is and and the way that the generation reacts to it is. In and, and, and a similar way to the way the, the millennial edge generation lords. had a big... That's what they do. <laughs> yes. So you get the edge lords on one side, and you get the 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 purple hair um, uh, lunatics on the other side who um, entertain the most bizarre, paradoxical, mind-blowing contradictions as like their fundamental belief. And they, they have an undying belief in every single institution of society, except for all the ones that have to be completely destroyed. They're... they're um, they're deranged. Mm. But Cooper, my my uh, my uh, um, co-host, said the other day that uh, I think it was in our episode last night. He said you have if you're an autist on the internet, you basically have two choices. You're either going to be a um, uh, let's say a transmission, or you're going to be a fascist. Those are your two options. You don't have and to censor, you don't have to censor yourself on my show. I'm not on YouTube anyway. Okay, yeah. So so <laughs> trans or fascist, those are your options. Um. So. Yeah, and that was that was a yeah. great observation. That's one of those things yeah. you're like, oh, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Exact same psychology, just just <laughs> occupying different different wings of the uh different wings of the same bird, you might say. Mm. Um so like horseshoe theory. Yes, right, right, right. <laughs> um so as I was watching all of this, I was thinking, okay, well, there's this one characteristic about the boomers that everybody is growing, it's becoming like almost a mainstream meme that the boomers simply won't fuck off. Like they just hold on and hold on and hold on and hold on and hold on. They've implanted themselves at the top of all these different institutions and probably the most prominent mainstream uh, uh, manifestation of this idea is everyone who's complaining about like term limits for politicians. And when everyone says, why is it that we're, we're voting between two 80 year olds? 
Mm-hmm. Like, why is this the best? Week? This is a this is a manifestation of this boomer phenomenon. Mm-hmm. The, there's a, a bunch of different reasons for it, but the the boomers themselves have remained in power as a generation much longer than previous generations. I think part of it is, and this is something I observed whenever you were talking to Buck about this, and I don't know if Buck brought it up. I don't remember him speaking of, on this, but like you said, my generation, Gen X, we were latchkey kids. Mm-hmm. We were very individualist. We didn't care about politics. I didn't get into politics until I was in my mid to late thirties. Mm-hmm. I didn't care about, I never even paid attention to politics. I didn't know what was going on. Who cares? Like I'm doing my thing. I don't care what these people are doing. They can do whatever the hell they want to do up there. And so that's part of it is we just mm-hmm. didn't care. We were just like, no, we're just going to go on and live our lives and do our things. Cause that's what we were taught. Like it's pull yourself up by your bootstraps and rugged individualism and go get them son. And it's like, all right, I'm off in mm-hmm. the world and I'm doing my thing. And I don't care about those, you know, faggots in DC. I, I just don't like, they mm-hmm. don't matter to me. And so we kind of just let them stay there. We didn't even yes. compete with them. Yes. I'm sure there are plenty of Gen Xers and we're starting to see this and we'll get into this here in a second. We're starting to see that there are plenty of impressive Gen Xers that could have competed at any given time, but we were so busy doing our own thing. It was mm-hmm. like, I don't have time to be dealing with this, you know? It was like, we joined the military not for service to the country. We joined the military to get free college. Yeah. And to have yeah. something to do. Yeah. It was like, yeah. oh, I can, I can go, I can go join the army for six years and I have a, what a, the equivalent of a bachelor's degree when I get out. All mm-hmm. right. Like whatever, you know, right. I like, shoot, I like little. shooting guns blowing things up, jumping out of airplanes. Why not? I'll go do that. You know, it wasn't because I had some kind of like loyalty to the United States. It was because I was like, what am I going to get? What's in it for me? Right. This first thing Mm -hmm. you taught in sales, what's in it for me. Right. And that's, that's all it was. And that's what my, how my generation looked at it. And then if you think about the millennials who came right after that, what happened with as, as most of the millennials were coming of age, you had nine 11. And so then you had this big revival in um uh, uh so the boomers had vietnam and the 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 way that that affected the public view of the armed forces then you have desert storm and then you have 911 that comes on the on the the heels of that and you get this big revival in patriotism and yeah let's you know uh, what's the toby keith uh, we're going to put a boot in their ass it's the american way this mm-hmm. is this is another now again. There's Toby Keith. He's 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 probably a young boomer, old Gen X. So mm-hmm. he's he's producing this media that is informing the minds of the younger people, and they're you know millennials. The, the oldest millennials were essentially 18 or so at the time of uh, 9/11. So a lot of millennials joined the military for much more for much nobler reasons, or at least they had that story to tell themselves mm-hmm. that. Where I'm doing this to protect my country. I'm serving my country. I'm, you know, and so they, they get that echo boomer um, effect there. And then you get also many of the millennials are their grandparents are the boomers, so they have this. Uh, um, you know, you kind of have the antagonistic relationship to your parents, but then you're close to your grandparents. That's a right. that's a common phenomenon. And so the millennials became the people that like, well, you know, our our children didn't live up to our expectations, but our grandchildren are going to, mm. and um. So, and then that contributes also to the helicopter parenting and to the, the, you had the moral majority rise in the nine in the eighties and nineties, um, with, uh, you know, taking all the swear words out of, dude, uh, I could, I could tell you some stories about raising my children and some of the stuff I dealt with, (laughs) like, as far as like participation trophies and shit like that, Uh I was like, I ain't paying for that. (laughs) Right. Right. Did, did they win? No, hey, no, he didn't get a damn trophy. <laughs> you know? And so then, and, and so then and people the, looking the, at you like you're insane. You're like, what the hell is wrong with you people? Yeah. The Zoomer response in that same like environment then is like, there's the, the really deep irony and, and just kind of the rejection of the legitimacy of, of all institutions. And so for them, it's like, they might like ironically take the, the participation trophy and then pretend that it's like a, a gold medal, like get really, really ostentatious with it and do this like really <laughs> performatively and ironically. 
Um, or they're going to be like, fuck your trophy. I don't want anything to do with your system. And it's not, they're not opposing it on the basis of I didn't earn that. They're opposing it on the basis of like, I don't, I don't want to be a part seen as a part of your thing. This, this explains is, this whole thing is gay. You know what, you know what else I'm seeing now? This explains the reaction to January 6th. Mm, go on. Okay. So whenever I saw what was going down, because I was driving, I was driving over the road at the time, and I knew that rally was taking place. So I turned on a live stream while I was driving and I was listening through it to it through my headset. And I see, and I'm I'm like witnessing all this stuff that's happening on January 6th. And I thought it was fucking hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I was dying. I was like, look at these stupid motherfuckers. You know, like mm -hmm. this is insanity. And Gen Z doesn't take that stuff seriously either. But no. the millennials and boomers, it broke their world. Yes. It's like the fascists are taking over. And we're like, this is absurd. Yes. Like, like this is the most absurd. And so every time I hear insurrection, I'm like, oh my God, you people are so stupid. Right. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. who's saying it? It's boomers and millennials saying it. Yes. You know, now there's, so there are, there's like the, the broad overarching generational personality or, 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 or framework kind of. And then with most of them, it seems like there's, there's kind of a split in the middle where you have like the younger boomers, the older boomers yeah, and, yeah. um, or younger Gen X, older Gen X, et cetera, et cetera. And then, uh, there's also something I've picked up on where you have like a, like a through line between the, the bracketed generations where within Gen X, you have people who are very much along the boomer millennial, um, axis sort of. They, 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 and they see themselves as not in alignment with their generation. So when you describe their generation to them, they're like, oh, well, that doesn't really fit me. I'm not really that way. But invariably, the way that they describe themselves as not being a part of their generation is in opposition to their generation. They're to the, 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 like the meme of their, their generation. So the millennials who don't identify with the millennials, they don't identify as something else. They identify as not millennials. So they're they kind of have this dialectic tension with their with their generation. Yeah, and, yeah, I can see that. I see what you're saying. And then the so the and then the way that ends up manifesting is because each of these generations is sort of a reaction to the the phenomena of the generations prior to them. The uh, the the Zoomers or sorry the Millennials who don't really fit with the Millennials either f land on the Boomer Millennial. Mm -hmm axis or the gen x zoomer axis mm. they um so they have this this uh um they tend to be much more kind of the like renegade like don't really care about the 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 the, the rules like i'm gonna go along with the rules just to whatever extent i need to make life easy on me but i don't actually really believe in them i'm kind of going my own way they have a lot more of that sort of individualistic um sort of rebellious streak to them you know what um, might be an interesting conversation for you to have a Cooper uh, hmm. is is a conversation on the way he views 9-11. Okay. I, yeah. I remember, okay, so my oldest son, he's right around Cooper's age. They're right around the same age, within a year. And when my oldest son was 19, we were um, going to Buffalo Wild Wings, and it was like, I think it was the anniversary of 9-11 or the anniversary of 9-11 was coming up. And so we're talking, and we're, and we're just – having a casual conversation about the events of 9-11 and then he looked at me after after we had been talking for about 30 minutes about the subject and he goes honestly i really don't care i don't remember mm -hmm. it it has no bearing on my life it's done nothing for me it's not it, it doesn't mean anything to me i don't know it's and it's kind of like i'm kind of like oh that's kind of the way i look at pearl harbor yeah yeah, it's like, okay, yeah. I know it happened, but nah, I don't feel yeah. any way about it. It just happened. Mm -hmm. It's it's a historical event, and okay, yeah. And that's the way, even though he was, I mean, he was like two, I was in I was in basic training when 9-11 happened, so he would have been about two and a half, almost three, mm. when, it, when it occurred. But he's just like, I don't remember it. Like, I don't know anything about it. Like, I know you were in the Army, and, you know, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But I don't know. I don't know anything about that. You know. It See, I I I remember it very distinctly, and I remember being 
I, I didn't, I wasn't traumatized by it. Cause I've never found those. I, I find it more exciting than anything else. It's like, Ooh, something interesting happening. You know, this, oh, this <laughs> like, I love it when the chessboard, nothing gets interesting because, ever happens. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm, I kind of, I'm a fan of chaos, I suppose. So it, it was never, it didn't affect me that way. And that's not necessarily, I think a generational thing. I think that's more just like a, a personality thing for me because I know a lot of my peers who like took it really seriously. Now, now for me, I was a big fan of the Toby Keith, like, hell yeah. You guys are going to come mess with us. Let's go, America. We're going to go put a boot in your ass. You know, so I, I was all on board with that sentiment. Of course, I was uh, I was 12 when it happened. And right. then um, w- yeah, went to high school. I remember being in high school, went to high school in Canada. And I remember getting into uh, debates with with my, you know, high school political debates. If you can if you can stomach that between Americans and Canadians. It was it was a beautiful, wonderful thing. Um I think somebody would have gotten beat up at my high school if that would have (laughs) happened. This is a very conservative Christian school. So it was just, uh, uh, it was, it was, it's funny looking back on it now, but so I was very much like, yeah, you know, we're, uh, um, uh, you know, oil and, or, or no, it was, it was, it was, no, 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 we're not in there for the oil. We're there because we're terrorism and we're protecting our interests and all that sort of thing. So I, I, I very much bought into that and took it very seriously. Mm. Um, I rem- and I remember that. And I remember then feeling this sense of kind of uh, um, like a connection to the older generations. It's like, oh, here's my thing now that I've experienced that um, now I'm 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 like a, I'm a person who's experiencing history. This is this is very I took it very seriously. Right. Um, so so as we're, we're kind of observing all of this and I'm realizing, OK, if I start doing a little bit of math, the youngest boomers, even by the oldest, oldest possible um metric the youngest boomers are 1968 something like that that puts them uh what is that uh 56 which means the youngest boomers possible are going to be retiring in uh what's the retirement age i don't even know what the retirement age is 63 65 65 so nine years they're nine years away from retirement Mm -hmm. that's the youngest ones the oldest ones are already retired most of them are dead already because and because we've had this phenomenon where the boomers have held on to held on to power have have, have insulated themselves at the top of these institutions for so long we're not going to have an experience of the generational die off that reflects past generational die offs because in, in the past you would have people that would get to a certain age and then they retire and then they'd, they'd they'd get replaced and you have younger blood come up and come through the system and we didn't have the same type of institutions then the, the things that, right. that Eric Weinstein calls the embedded growth obligations. Those institutions are a phenomenon that really came into its own in the boomer lifespan. Mm-hmm. So um, these younger generations have been backing up, backing up, backing up, backing up. And this is a lot of what's causing um, a lot of economic dysfunction is essentially the boomer generation trying to maintain their their all of their Ponzi schemes trying to keep themselves in power as long as possible and trying to set themselves up so that when they go, oh, many of them explicitly are saying, when, when we go, we want to make sure that we don't have any money left. We want to give it all away. We want to spend it all. We want to save it all to be spent on ourselves when we're, when we're gone. We want to, so, so the, the entire economic system is getting distorted because of this. And then we're going to see a rapid die off of the boomers, which means a, a much more rapid than normal like realignment around a, a different wealth distribution. And when I talk about generational wealth distribution, I'm not saying fathers giving money to their children. I'm saying boomers literally being all dead, so it's not possible for boomers to hold on to wealth anymore because they're dead. So by necessity, the only people who can hold on to that wealth are going to be Gen X or younger. Gen X has been waiting for their time in the sun, essentially. I don't. And I, I, and they get, now I would disagree now- with you on that just a tad, just a little bit. Let me like push back. Mm-hmm. I don't think Gen X has been waiting for their time in the sun. Like I said earlier, I think we've just been doing our own thing. There, and, there and, are and, Gen and X people kinda, who have been waiting, and we kind of looked around and go, "What the fuck are they doing?" <laughs> uh-huh. <Yeah. laughs> so yeah. I, I wanted to find these people. I wanted to find who are these Gen X people. Where the the ones who are going to be stepping into the, the the all of these abandoned roles or the ones who are going to be at the helm of whatever things replace those roles. If these roles die off with the boomers, that means that a new role is going to occupy that that space in the human hierarchy. Who are those people going to be? I want to know what they're thinking about. What are their priorities? What are they focused on? Where are they moving? 
So let's, because let's, this is basically a way of seeing into the future. Well, let's introduce it this way, because did you um, did you happen to listen to the uh, Tucker Carlson, Lex Friedman interview? No, I'm not a Lex I've heard Friedman. of it. I'm, I'm not a Lex Friedman fan, but I heard a couple of people talk about it and they're like, Tucker was great on it. And I was like, all right, well, I'll check it out. I'll see what what it's all about. And I think Tucker is like an older Gen Xer. He's like, he said he's, I think he says he's 54. So he's an older Gen right. Xer. Yeah. One of the things he mentioned, he's like, he was, he was telling Lex, he's like, look, you're a younger guy. He's like, don't try to become a billionaire for the sake of becoming a billionaire. Because in the process, you lose your soul. Hmm. And I think what we're witnessing is the boomers have gotten to a point where they're basically have, have found that, uh, that cor uh, corruption. I don't, I don't know a better word to use um, to, to make money for the sake of making money. Right. Mm -hmm. You think in like Nancy Pelosi making investments in the stock market when she knows a bill's about to come down. We, we think about, Joe Biden getting his brother deals in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, we think about, you know, Hunter Biden heading over to China, making money, going over to Ukraine, making money, you know, on the, on the back of his father's name. And, and so in, in, in Tucker's warning, he's like, look, making money isn't the problem. Making money for the sake of making money is the issue. Mm. And I think we're in a situation where we're witnessing the political class, the, the, the boomer, uh, the boomer elites doing that, doing just that they're, they're willing to sell out anything just for the sake of making money. They're willing to start any war just because it's going to enrich themselves and their friends. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's the gen X mindset was never about just being rich for the sake of being rich. It was like, let's do something that excites us and that matters and mm -hmm. et cetera. And so politics was never in the really in the, in the view because mm -hmm. there was no money to be made in politics. As far as we were concerned, now we see the results of, of what politics has has bred. And we're like, Oh, okay. Well, I guess there was money to be made in politics. Luckily, I didn't do this for the sake of money. I did this because it was something I really enjoyed. I can think of friends of mine whenever I was like 15 years old and they had computers and I was like, what the hell is that? He's like, oh, you don't know what this is? And we're playing like the original Doom on a PC, you know, and it was it was like the worst graphics. It was better, barely better than Atari at that time. You know, <laughs> like, uh -huh. and, and so... I can remember, and, and there were guys like that 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 chased that passion of of technology. I wasn't one of them. I liked being outside. I liked working with my hands. That was just always what I enjoyed. So, but I had lots of friends that were right there at the beginning of of the kind of the computer craze, and mm -hmm. and we're getting into it when in ninety four before there was really anything known as the internet, you know, um, I, I often say I wasn't, I, I never got on the, I didn't get on the internet until 2011. So I'm way behind. Cause mm -hmm. I always thought like the physical matter and things you could get out there and touch and do and feel that was what mattered. You know, I never saw all this stuff coming. So, um, but, but I think when, when I hear, Tucker Carlson say that don't become a billionaire for the sake of becoming a billionaire, because then you lose your soul. And I start seeing people like Vivek or Peter Thiel and these PayPal mafia guys that, that you talk about. I'm like, yeah, that they were just following passion. They were just following a passion mm -hmm. and, and it kind of led them the, in this direction and it led them the, in this direction because they looked at the, the, the political system that was being handed down to them. And they were like, well, this is all kinds of broken. We got to do something about this. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So they have the, um, so and, if, if and we're maybe, talking, it, I'm sorry, just, just real yeah, quick. Yeah. Maybe these kind of people 
no matter what generation they are, like you said earlier, there, there are definitely going to be different types of mindsets in every generation. And mm -hmm. maybe these types of people just see a problem and want to fix it. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's, maybe that's just who they are. They're just I like, think it's that. And I think it's also engineering kind of mindset. Yes, yes, yes. So they, if, if, if you think about the types of people that we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're honed in on here, we're not just honed in on an entire generation. We're honed in on, on particular representatives of that generation. And by definition to be where they're at, we can assume a number of things about their, their past. And some of these, I mean, you can go confirm some of these things yourself, but even just looking at them, like if you're a billionaire, successful venture capitalist, um, uh, tech founder, then, and you're, I don't know, somewhere between 40 and 55, somewhere in that range, then we can reason a lot of things about how you grew up. Like clearly you grew up familiar with computers very early on, which means you were very much involved in the computer world during the 80s, 90s, into the 2000s. So you experienced the early internet. You experienced... Um, uh, your your mind is naturally wired to think along the lines of a computer programmer or a developer, or you're, you're someone who's very familiar with complex systems, understanding how to optimize them, how to make little tweaks, how to analyze data, how to, uh, the other thing would be the, the um, like the, the billionaire side of it or the very successful investor side of it is you have to understand management of people. You have to understand how to navigate a tax code. You have to understand um, monetary policy to some degree. You have to have an understanding of, of um, uh, global events and, um, and how to navigate within the elite power structures, how to submit bills, how to um, navigate through regulations, how to manage lobbyists, how to like these are this is a really diverse range of skill sets that a lot of these people have developed that by necessity of them being where they are right now. Um, so they have a really deep understanding of the system as it is exactly. They've, they've lived it on mm. every, in every possible way. Yet they also have a really uh, uh, well uh, inculcated sense of what the system is supposed to be. Because this is precisely how they made their money. This is precisely how they got to be as successful as they are, is by playing on the on the delta between what the system is and what the system is ought to be, and what the system ought to be. Mm -hmm. Because the if you're if you're getting ahead, you're figuring out where the shortcomings, where the shortfalls are. You're figuring out where the inefficiencies are. So you have to have an understanding of like just by default, you're going to be in these circles. You're going to hear these people talking. You're going to have the uh, an understanding of of. Um, what the government structure is, how it's supposed to operate, et cetera, et cetera. But then you also have an understanding of how it actually operates, which means any guy who's come up and, and become, he's in the age range of like, say, 40 to 55, and there's edge cases on both ends, but approximately 40 to 55, you've got a lot of guys who are both very, very familiar with managerialism and, well, not both. They are very, very familiar with the managerialism and they fucking hate it. They don't want to have to work with it. It's mm -hmm. been their biggest bugaboo their entire lives. Yeah. Now that doesn't necessarily mean they're like, okay, like as a man, they're like, yeah, you know, we're going to cite James Burnham and describe the, the flaws in managerialism and we're going to come take a blowtorch to it. I'm not saying that. Right. I'm saying that they're primed to think that way. So with, if the issue with the existing system is, or if, if one of the major issues with the existing system is uh, runaway managerialism that's beginning to eat the system alive from the inside. These guys' whole modus operandi, their whole ethos for their entire professional career has been looking at organizations that are, are decrepit or poorly run or um, shouldn't exist at all, identifying what's wrong with them and um, uh making them successful essentially. So if you're a venture capitalist, like what's your thing? You go and you look for, you look at how the company is operating. You look at the financials, you look at the, their business plan. You look at how their marketing is done. You look at how their sales is done. You look at all these different things. How are they, what's their, their, um, uh, uh, if they have like a, like warehousing and they have to deal with supply chains, how can we optimize these things for efficiencies? Like you have to have a wide range of understanding of all of this, but then they have a really clear understanding of what are the things that cost the most money 
and cause the biggest headaches for the least amount of payoff. So they're going to be running into these managerial inefficiencies constantly, and they've become successful by figuring out how to navigate and overcome those. But now you're getting to the point where, as you said, these people kind of grew up where it was just like, yeah, the government is the government and it does its thing. And we're just busy here in the private sector or in whatever business that we're doing. And the government is just sort of a constant. But now it's becoming clearer and clearer as everything else is going to hell in a handbasket. It's like, okay, there's something wrong here. Something, something's not working right. Mm-hmm. And this doesn't necessarily have to be an ideological perspective. And for the most part, I think a lot of these guys, it isn't. They're, they have can this I, sort of naive Americanism. I, Go ahead. Can I relate something just like yeah. real quick? One of the things I said a while back, I think I was talking to Pete and I was like, you know, like I was, I, I grew up a latchkey kid. And mm-hmm. it, it, when I look around at the libertarian movement and especially those that call themselves anarcho-capitalists, a lot of these guys are my age. Mm. They're in their forties. A lot of these. And I'm like, I was like, I didn't convert to this because of ideological preferences. I converted to this because I saw that that shit was fucked up. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. And I'm like, get rid of that. Like yes. whatever, however you have to get rid of that. That's what, that's a problem. What's happening there. So what you're saying is making a lot of sense to me. It's like really like connecting with me because mm. I was never going to be the guy that told you, I read a bunch of books, but I was never going to be the guy that told you, Oh, you got to read Mises. You got to read Rothbard. You got to, that wasn't the way I approached it. I was just mm-hmm. like, yeah, what they say makes sense. But instinctually I was already like, man, fuck all you like, fuck you all. I don't care. Like y'all do Y'all go to hell in a handbasket for all I care. I don't want anything to do with whatever y'all are doing. Just leave mm-hmm. me alone. Let me be. Let me live on my property, raise my chickens, raise my dogs, have my wife, and I'm fine. Just leave me alone. That was my entire... And there are more people that that are libertarian just because of that. Because yes. it's an ideology that offers you that as the solution. Mm-hmm. So then imagine having that perspective or, or, or feeling that way, but also being worth hundreds of millions or billions of dollars right. and being <laughs> running these kinds of companies and having to navigate around this sort of stuff, dealing with the, the long house, as they call it, with the, like the HR departments that are that are, you know, there's some new policy out where like you're sitting here like evaluating, I don't know, like like currency differentials or something and and how this new trade policy is going to affect have the bottom access. line. And then somebody comes in and says, um, sir, uh, we had a, an employee complain because you used the wrong pronoun. Um, this, this employee is not, <laughs> is not her. It's sure. Please use sure. When you like, dude's going to be like, are you serious? I'm not writing a novel. What do you fucking yeah. talk about pronouns? <laughs> right. I, whatever. So it's like the, the first reaction to something like that is gonna be like, uh, whatever. Okay. Sure. Oh, right. Make, write me a note. All right. Anyways, back to work. Yeah. Right. But then this sort of thing starts to build and then you see, okay, you see a a CEO who gets ousted and, 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 uh, sued, gets his pants sued off for, um, you know, cracking a wise comment or something with some chick. And then it's like, okay, well, this, this is becoming a problem, but I can't attack this by just like complaining about it because then this, that's going to happen to me. So, and a lot of this stuff has been happening over the course of like 10 years, if even that eight years. Mm. So a lot of these guys are, are there, they have a lot of this Gen X mindset of the, the, the institutions of society are just there and they kind of do their thing. And there's the people who are involved in them, but I'm doing my thing. I'm, I'm, I'm working on my thing, but increasingly your thing is getting in my thing. Mm -hmm. Increasingly you're getting in my way. You're fucking up what I'm trying to do. And now now I'm starting, okay, I, I find I create a Twitter account. I want to see what's happening. Everyone tells me all the news is happening on Twitter. I'm going to create a Twitter account. And I'm here and I like tweet something and I get brigaded by a band of, of deranged communists or something. And I'm like, what in the fuck is going on? Yeah. This is absurd. Now, yeah. to be this type of person, I don't need to be some radical political ideologue. In fact, that's part of the, that's part of the selling point here. I'm not some radical political ideologue. I just want this shit to work right so I can get back to my business. Mm-hmm. 
I want to, I'm, I'm trying to innovate here. Like we're trying to, to, to do some sort of complicated, inno complicated, innovative technological thing or what have you. And, you know, now I go out, I leave my office and I'm stepping over human shit on the sidewalk. And there's some guy shooting up over there. I, I can't even own a car in the city anymore because the window keeps getting broken. And, and here at the border, they're just, there's millions of people just flooding across the border all the time. I'm getting emails sent to me from um, my, my DEI officer I was forced to hire, who's trying to schedule another meeting for us to sit down and talk about, about um, internalized whiteness or something. And to, to this type of guy, this is like, this is fucking absurd. We can't, we can't have a country like this. So what do we need to do to get control of our company or get control of our country so I can get control of my company? Right. You I'm not parodying this a little bit, but you can't trying to even tell run the story. A, you can't even run a company like that, let alone a country. And so when they see it on the micro level, they're like, what the hell is going on on the macro level? And the thing is, is these guys have the money the power and the influence as Jason Stapleton might say that I had to throw that in your face. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that I'll tell you they, something funny after off camera. Okay. That they have, they have the access, they have yes. the access. And so that is well, it's like, Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. Vivek knows when he gets up there on stage with these people, these lifelong politicians, he's like, they don't believe this stuff. They're lying mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. You know? Right. And he's just, and he's Gen X enough to say, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm just going right. to tell you. Like, this is all a bunch of bullshit. You people are fucking insane. Mm hmm And you notice the way that he's so, so Vivek is, I think he's 38. So he's, he's an old, old millennial, very much on that Gen X uh, um, uh, border. Oh, but okay. if you notice the majority of was older than that, but okay. But so he's what he's I think he's particularly interesting here because notice the difference in the way that he goes about communicating a lot of this stuff versus someone like, say, Elon, where mm. like Vivek is not the guy that's going to go up on stage and go, fuck y'all. Elon did that. Yeah. Vivek won't do that. Vivek is much more polished. And, and some of this is personality, but some of this is also, a, I think, a generational perspective where and which is part of what I think makes Vivek so compelling is that he he speaks to millennials. Mm -hmm. He speaks the millennial language. Mm. And um, which also makes him, there's a lot of boomers that are like, oh, I like this nice Indian man. He's, you know, he's saying a lot of things that make a lot of sense. But if you dig, if you kind of like look at, at the, like the layer underneath what he's saying, he's also identifying with this, the, the, the older kind of generation, the Gen X, more pure Gen X mindset that is like, not doesn't necessarily have a strong beholden instinct to the institutions. They're more, they're, they're kind of like the institution needs to do its job. So if that means we need to kind of move things around and, 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 you know, color outside the lines a little bit. All right, let's, you know, whatever, we need to get this thing to do its job. Whereas the, you know, the boomer and millennial is going to be much more like, Oh, you know, we need to have, we need to do things the right way and go by the book and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think this is a, uh, uh, you're beginning to see the the Gen X mind, and specifically not just the Gen X mind, like the Gen X, like on a broader level, the Gen X mind sort of coming up, coming into its own, really, in um, uh, popular culture and being reflected back with the Zoomers. I think this is starting to have uh, um, the ground is being laid for these specific Gen X guys, these tech guys. And these guys who have a deep understanding of the tech world, the regulation, navigating through, um, dealing with regulators, et cetera, et cetera. They've got a deep understanding, and they're starting to get the cover to be able to start talking about this stuff publicly. You're here. He's you here. Hi, Tommy. Hey, buddy. Hey, you want to say hi? I did. You did. Hey, how are you doing, Bubba? Good. <laughs> You getting ready right. for bed? I love you, big guy. Okay. <laughs> have a good sleep, okay? Okay, why well, do you have that one there, too? So I can look at things over here and look at things over there. So you can look at um, where Big Daddy lives. Yeah, that's that's where Big Daddy lives. That's right. Big Daddy is his imaginary mountain lion friend. Huh. <laughs> 
You know, uh, after all these years, after all these years, I still don't call him imaginary. I call mine invisible. That might tell (laughs) you something. I might have been visited by somebody. Yeah. (laughs) So be careful. Walk on eggshells on that one, buddy. Yeah. He calls them imaginaries. Takes the eye off the beginning. They're just imaginaries. They're imaginaries. Yeah, yeah. That might that might be a race, man. You need to. <laughs> you gotta be careful. <laughs> so okay, what were we saying? Oh, we were we were talking about Vivek's age. Oh yeah, um, being millennial, mm-hmm. which is interesting. I didn't even realize that. I I thought he was like forty two, forty three. Yeah, I, I think and I think he's one of those that, like I said before, you kind of have this like through line through <laughs> the millennial generation where there's a lot of millennials who I've talked to like me. I'm a millennial, but I, I and I, I, I see my millennialness every once in a while. Cooper especially points it out to me every once in a while. But uh, I identify with and I see the world much more similarly than to to Gen X than I do to a lot of millennials. I, yeah, think I mean, there's is, there's something super like like fuck you about starting strive uh-huh like that was it i mean and, and and then you mentioned like he never comes out and says it like elon musk does and you're like i'm like you're right he never comes out and just be like yeah like he's like i'm here to compete with blackrock because i disagree with esg and dei and blah 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 but he's never like man screw these guys you don't need them mm-hmm. you know and I think that's that's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't trust him, because I mean, there's there's other reasons, too. But in, in particular, because he's you you really have to uh, kind of listen below the surface with him to hear how radical he is. He's he I mean, he's the closest thing I've ever seen to a neo reactionary politician. If you listen to I've like, especially you, his I've long form you, interviews, I've heard you say that. Like, what do you mean by that? Uh, and, and I guess I'm not great with these labels, so maybe I don't really get it like as as deeply as some people would. Um, I I just know that what I like when I especially like you said on long form interviews, I listen to him and I'm like, yeah, I agree with this guy. Like he's saying things that like, yeah, you know. And I have my my qualms with with who he is and in his his background and you know um but you know i'm like all right like you've always said don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good and you know i always have to keep that in mind Mm -hmm. you know and that when i look at like the stage of politicians you know including trump that he's up against i'm like yeah he's probably the one who's closest to the way i think about things Mm mm-hmm it's the, but, the near reactionary thing that I think what stands out for him most about that is his very clear understanding of elite theory. Mm. And he, and he talks, he, see, he doesn't come out and, and say like, Oh, there's this thing called elite theory and yada, yada, yada. He kind of gets close to that sometimes, but you can hear it in the way that he's describing these things. He, he uses the term professional managerial class. Yes, lot. he does. Yeah. And he goes into great detail describing the way that power works there's the way there's like the like 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 um uh, formal power and informal power and the way these different bureaucracies relate to one another and the functioning of the system he has a really deep understanding of the way the managerial system itself functions and he he describes these things in ways that i, I mean prior to three or four years ago the only place i'd ever heard anybody describe to like talk about power in this these sorts of ways was like unqualified reservations. That was basically the first person that I ever listened to that actually talked about these things in that way. And that's not because there weren't obviously the vast majority of mold bug is like referencing much older books and, and much older thinkers. Right. But um, there isn't like a big proliferation of, of this sort of thought out there. At least there wasn't until a couple of years ago. And then this sort of, this, it kind of started started building and bubbling up around um, the kind of the core like mold bug. And then you have, um, you've got your academic agent and you've got um, uh, Pete Quinones and a number of Charles. different guys, Charles Haywood. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of these guys who are now, um, and then Twitter is where the bulk <laughs> of this has happened, where the, the bulk of like neo reactionary thought has, has sort of coalesced, but it also existed for quite a while in the old sort of blogosphere 
there's a lot of, there's old blogs where a lot of this thought really started to develop back in like the message board kind of days, um, which is did really how like, did this uh, like, develop like out of reservations a, itself. Did this develop out of like the red, the original red pill movement or there's, there's a big overlap with that. Okay. Um, there's also the uh, um, like Scott Alexander's rationalism um, slate star codex. Uh, a lot of that has gone more, you had like new atheism and then you had rationalism and there's sort of like the new atheists. And then, and then there's a lot of current people who would be essentially neo reactionary thinkers who were influenced by, or for used to be used to read slate star codex. Um, so, and again, a lot of these people are either old millennials or, or gen X they're, they're all from that same, that same age, that same age bracket. Um, and they, then they see the world very similarly. And then you've got a big overlap with, with programmers and developers and even the idea of growing up playing video games. This is something that, that, that um, is a psychological break between boomers and Gen X. Like boomers didn't grow up playing video games because they literally didn't exist. Then um, it wasn't until they were already adults, essentially. And then uh, Gen X grew up, uh, especially later Gen X grew up playing video games. And then millennials especially really did. Mm. But so it was like kind of, I don't know, would it be 1970, 1975, maybe 1972, 1975 to uh, and on. Like those are the people who grew up playing video games, having them at their disposal to play. Right. And then the, so then there's the way that that makes you think more, you, you know, you, you kind of have a natural like game theoretic approach to life and. Um, and you have the idea of like developing a character and um, navigating in a universe and accumulating resources. And these are all sorts of things that kind of rewire your brain. <clears throat> Do you think, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to sound super progressive here, but it's actually a point that's made that I actually kind of like see where they're coming from. So the, when the United States, when Americans think about a president, they have a particular kind of like idea in mind. There's, there's an archetype, right? And, uh, they, a lot of, a lot of people would say that's the reason that, that Biden was elected and, and chosen for that position in 2020. Do you, do you think that Vivek was recruited or do you think that he kind of stepped out on his own and and did that to run for president? I think so. The way that I came across him was, I mean, I got to kind of wander off a little far field and come back around to to, to mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. um, the way I came across him was right on the heels of doing this sort of generational analysis and starting to think, okay, there's got to be. The, the, there's got to be like Gen X people, the next, like the, the, the most significant Gen X figures, the ones who are going to rule the day after the, the boomers finally pass on. I want to see who those people are. And so I started trying to build a profile of their, of their mind. And so I could start and, and trying to figure out, okay, what cultures are they probably going to come out of? Which, which cultures are going to be overly represented by the Gen X mind and, and, and are also going to lend themselves to being able to govern and rule and be wealthy and all that sort of thing. And Tech was the very obvious one, uh, the the whole programmer culture, and then having been exposed to a lot of guys in um, my more entrepreneurial side of 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 my content con consumption, uh, guys like the like Tim Ferriss and Naval Ravikant, and then you've got uh, um, uh, Joe Rogan is an obvious one, Alex Jones, Tucker Carlson, Elon Musk. These were Peter Thiel. These were all the guys that that were coming to mind for me. So. I hadn't paid any attention to Vivek at the time. Um, a, a friend of mine had told me I should. I was like, yeah, whatever. You know, he's just like uh, Republican Andrew Yang. And then he was like, no, like, like you, should, you should listen to him. So then as I was thinking about this, I was like, okay, well, tech bro. Hmm. Tech bro, billionaire. Um, let me go listen to him. See what, see what he's saying. See if there's maybe some connections here that I can, I can learn. And I started listening to him, his long form stuff. And I was like, oh, whoa, okay. So th he's, this guy's very interesting. But if he understands the halls of power the way he very clear, clearly does, if he's calling this, like virtually everything that he's saying, I agree with. 
right. about the way the system operates and, and why things are happening the way that they are and all the different corruption and fraud and all this sort of thing. So why the hell is he running for president? Because clearly he doesn't actually think he could win. Because it's just like, you know, like the whole system is on guard for a billionaire who comes out of nowhere and decides he's going to run for president. This is kind of like a, you know, this just happened and the whole whole system lost its mind. So right. trying to trying to run a retread <laughs> there doesn't seem doesn't seem like the, the thing to do. And clearly, but at the same time, like if he understands how things are, he's not going to come out here on like some sort of a messaging trip or something. It's not like, oh, well, like the libertarians do where we're going to have a guy run and he'll just introduce people to libertarianism and then make our party bigger or whatever. And he's not going to be this like lone voice crying out in the wilderness who's just going to go throw himself on the castle ramparts and and sacrifice himself for the cause or something like this. These things don't go together. So, so I, I, I reasoned, okay, he must have, He's the tip of someone's spear. I don't know if he's the tip of his own spear or the tip of someone else's spear. The fact that he's he's basically a billionaire would tell me he's he's probably not just a complete patsy. Um, but he, my guess then, and I think this is probably I, I think I would still agree that I think that he is in collaboration with other people. Um, so I don't know that it's strictly that he was recruited. Or I don't remember what the other option was that you said. Or that he just chose to do it on his own, kind of threw himself into the fire. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I definitely don't think it was that. I also don't really think that he was recruited so much as, um, I mean, I think the the Peter Thiel connection is just too blatantly obvious there. Yeah. Growing up, like going to college, being friends with J.D. Vance, Peter Thiel is one of the three primary investors in Strive. Um, and mm -hmm. then... Uh, he and JD Vance and Peter Thiel are three of the primary investors in Rumble together. Uh, you know, the he there's an article in what in the Washington Post that was written in mid 2022, I think, about uh, Peter Thiel. And uh, I found it when I just Googled Peter Thiel, Matt Gates, because I wanted to see if there were connections between the two of them. And I found this article is very interesting. And partway through it, it quotes with respect to, to Thiel, it quotes. Strive Asset Management founder and CEO or whatever it is of uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. This is long before he announced his run for president. And so they're like, he was already seen as a close associate of Peter Thiel at the time, which is obvious given the investment and everything. So I think, you know, Peter Thiel obviously had his, he had J.D. Vance, he got J.D. Vance in office. He tried to get Blake Masters into office. He's going to try again. Uh, and what I realized is I was listening to Vivek because I was like, this is Blake Masters, but Indian. That's what I'm hearing, which so that was like, OK, so this seems like the next play in a run of 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 plays. So that is I think uh, I, I, I suspect that Vivek is enough of a um, I think he has significant enough status himself that he wouldn't be just recruited for something like this. I think this is something that was probably in the works. And that he was ready to go. And then these, and then he confirmed in the interview with this on the Sean Ryan show interview he was on, he said, he's, he's uh, uh, working with a large network of people who have a background in venture capital and organizational management and um, psychology and sociology. And he listed off a bunch of different things and was like, okay, there it is. Like, that's the, you don't you don't accumulate a large network of people that are, <coughs> are planning out in great detail how to, um, construct like a, a way of qualifying people to work in government positions. You don't accumulate a large network like that because you're just some guy who just hit the phones and was like, Hey, you guys want to work with me? You know, there's, there's, there's definitely something going on behind the scenes with him. Right. Yeah. I, I just figure like if there's going to be a recruiting effort, you would, you would be more likely to get a Peter Thiel recruit recruited than you would have a Vivek Ramaswamy just due to the racial yeah. issues the yes. the undertones that 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 carries mm -hmm. so that's that's kind of why i was asking you that uh it was just kind of one of those things i was thinking i was like i like what matt's talking about with the paypal mafia i think it's very interesting but how did vivek end up in this position you know that was kind of mm -hmm. my thought you know and i i ran into Va to vivek 
in 2020, I think it was when I was doing all my research for ESG. Um, I ran into his book, Woke Inc. And I gra grabbed it on audiobook and I would listen to it while I would be driving. And uh, I started reaching out to him in 2021, trying to get him on my podcast long mm. before he even started running for president before anybody was ever talking about him. I think two months after I started reaching out to him, he ended up on the Glenn Beck podcast. And mm. then, and then my buddy, uh, Kyle Matovic reached out to me and he's like, Hey, Patrick bet David's looking for somebody to come on his show and talk ESG. You should, you should reach out to him. I was like, he's going to choose Vivek Ramaswamy. I like I already knew I was like this guy mm. is saying it the right way and Patrick bet David's a business guy he's going to want to mm. talk to somebody from that lens so I was like no he's going to choose but he's another one by the way Patrick bet David that's another I of actually, this Gen X like uh new counter elite sort of perspective I like his show I I mean it's not my favorite show but I'll watch it every once in a while he'll have somebody on there and I'll be like oh I'm going to check out what it, what he's talking to this guy about because he's not afraid to ask some questions. Mm -hmm. He's not afraid to dig into stuff, you know, and challenge people. And so, yeah. Did you, did you listen to his recent episode with Eric Prince? I listened to some of it. I didn't catch all mm. of it, but yeah, it I did. Very good. I caught like the first hour of it. I didn't listen to the whole thing. I need to go back. I listened to a lot of clips mm -hmm. that were put up after the fact, but yeah, I didn't catch the entire show. Um, so yeah, but he, he is, he's somebody that's, that's interesting to me. And, uh, I see him creating this value attainment and the different shows that they're putting out. And I find them very interesting too. And I'm like, cause you got like sauce cast with, uh, with Adam who kind of catches like kind of the red pill kind of side of things. And then you have the, that. I, I always want to call him Vinny. I don't even know what his real name is, but that Italian dude from New York who's so funny. And I'll 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 watch him every once in a while because he is hilarious. He and he's loud and funny. He's just a New Yorker through and through. So I really enjoy that. Mm. So let's do this because I know you can't stay on all night, neither can I. I have to work tomorrow. Um let's dive into what is the PayPal Mafia. Let's get into this because we've kind of been skirting around the issue. We're talking about specific people. Let's narrow it down. Tell us what is the PayPal mafia, where the name came from, what's going on with project 2025. Let's like dive into that type of stuff. What's, what's the agenda behind all this? Okay. So PayPal mafia is, is actually a term like it has its own Wikipedia page and it's become for us kind of a shorthand for this, this group of, of you might call them like rogue tech elites or something like that, that are, that are forming in our opinion, essentially a rising counter elite. Um, and by counter elite, we mean people who would absolutely be considered part of an elite class who are not on board with the existing trajectory of the regime um, to varying degrees. But the, the thing their consensus is that they're not on board with things continuing as they have been their needs. In their mind, largely, there needs to be some kind of major reforms and the extent to which that there's 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 divergence in like how far this needs to happen. But the fact of the matter is that they they are not beholden to the existing regime in its current form. And they have the means, the resources, the influence to actually make a big dent here. Um, the way that we stumbled upon them was through Vivek and his connection to Peter Thiel. And then I just began, Jason from the Two Bit Podcast said, "Hey, there's this, this this PayPal mafia. I want to do a PayPal mafia friend or Fed. Let's uh, um, I, let's see see if there's something there connecting him with with Vivek." And so I just went down the PayPal mafia Wikipedia page and just started clicking on every single guy's name, reading all the different uh, uh, companies that he's been involved with, the places that he's lived, you know. And first of all, I mean, if you're doing the PayPal mafia, then like that itself, you're naturally going to be, everyone's going to be within like one degree of Peter Thiel, essentially. But as I was branching out from them, I'm following this train with, with Peter mm -hmm. Thiel, but I'm, I'm 
Like I click this guy and I read about him and it mentions this company that he did with this person. So I click that and I go and I read about him and it mentions this other thing he invested in with this other person. So I click that person and I'm going down this daisy chain of links and I kept coming back to Peter Thiel. Everything kept coming back to Peter oh. Thiel. And I'd already been pretty well aware of him. I was very aware of his his Girardian um, uh, uh, of emphasis. And uh, I used to listen to Eric Weinstein quite a bit, who was 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 close with him. I followed uh, J.D. Vance and Blake Masters. I've been aware of Peter Thiel as sort of like a libertarian adjacent sort of, but but kind of a little more complex than that. And yeah, I, I remember aware. he was doing the uh, what was it? The offshoring where they the were seasteading. Yeah, yeah, seasteading. I re- yeah. that's when I first like stumbled into him. I was like, "What is that?" You know, yeah, right. So, and then I was aware of what happened with him and Gawker, where Gawker was like at the peak of their power, and they they outed him for being gay. He was he was gay, but he was very private about it. He's a very private person in general, mm-hmm. and he was incensed by it. But the way he chose to go about it was was pretty gnarly. Was Hulk the, Hogan was yeah, in the middle he, of suing He weaponized Gawker, Hulk Hogan. <laughs> and he just bankrolled Hulk Hogan's lawsuit and bankrupted Gawker. He he absolutely burned Gawker to the ground, pissed on him, and walked away. And 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 I don't know if he's ever even publicly acknowledged it. He's I he hasn't talked about it extensively. So th- I was like, this is a guy that you don't want to fuck with a guy like this. This yeah. is a guy that that knows how things work. And he's he's an activist billionaire, um, but he's an activist billionaire who, at least, you know, being kind of libertarian adjacent, it kind of gives you an idea of the way he sees the world. Having a deep understanding of Gerard, he was a direct student of Gerard. Mm. Um, has a pretty a significant understanding of the world there. Pretty significant implications about his understanding of the world, I should say. Um, and I get the sense that he doesn't actively want me dead. He doesn't actively want to kill my children. He doesn't want to to um, uh, replace me with a robot. He doesn't want to import infinity third worlders. Like he doesn't like these are things that that make him stand out as someone who's who's wielding influence within the existing system. Um, but it's probably the closest thing I could find to a friend within the the existing power structure. Mm-hmm. And then there's the clear connection with him and Elon. That's and so I, that was kind of the extent of my understanding of the PayPal mafia. That PayPal was a thing he and Elon did together. It's been well documented. They sort of mm-hmm. had a bit of a divorce, and they kind of kissed and made up, and and have kind of gone their own separate directions. Um, but as I started going through all of these other guys, I was like, man, the list of guys on this PayPal mafia. If you if you put their net worths together, you're in the like hundreds and hundreds of billions range. These are guys who have been invested in, they're all cross invested in like all of the largest startups and most, most successful tech companies in, in the world that, or at least in the United States, basically everything except for um, Microsoft and, uh, and Amazon. Those sort of kind of have their own little circles. There's a little bit of crossover. Google is sort of a bit of a standalone as well, although one of the PayPal Mafia guys was the founder of YouTube. Um, So there's some crossover there too. Speaking of Microsoft, did you hear about the uh, the lawsuit that Elon Elon Musk filed against Sam Altman? Really? Yeah, because they started Chat GPT together as open source AI. And Sam Altman oh. sold it to Microsoft yes. for, to make money. And Elon's like, no, this was supposed to be completely free. You cannot do that. And so he's suing Sam Altman. Interesting. Sorry, I did you you mentioned Microsoft and that just clicked. Yeah, that oh, I'm gonna have to. There's a lot of different potential implications. I'm going to have to chew on that one for a little bit because there's that's a. I, I think it just came down this spread. week. Yeah, I think okay. it just came down either either late last week or early this week. Yeah, it was because huh. I've been saying it here recently. Yeah, so there's there's the PayPal mafia term is not. Um, I want to make it clear what we're what we're not saying. Um, we're not saying that all of the guys on the PayPal mafia Wikipedia are meeting in dark rooms together, planning out these things. They're all secret 
you know, they're, they're, they're all secret Nazis or, you know, whatever. Like I, I, um, in fact, there are specific members of the, uh, the so-called PayPal mafia who were very much not, um, rogue elite by any stretch of the imagination. The most prominent of them would be Reed Hoffman. Um, these are, some of them are very much regime creatures. What we're describing is more of a, um, an emerging, um, techno optimist sort of, uh, Silicon Valley movement where Silicon Valley has long been associated with the, you know, essentially the rainbow mafia and the, you know, like the, the, um, what would you call it? I guess like the, the, the HR department ideology that mm -hmm. has, has proliferated throughout the, all the tech censorship and all this sort of thing. But as I, as I started digging into this and I heard from some, as I started talking about it, people started reaching out to me. And one thing that I've heard very clearly is that the tech companies are not, uh, especially the leadership of the tech companies, have basically been held hostage by their own companies. They're, it's been the federal government leaning on them and basically forcing them into these censorship and, um, uh, uh, what would you say, like electoral fortification, all these sorts of things. These are things that in, in, a, in a lot of cases have been foisted upon the the tech leadership the tech leadership themselves have a very interesting view of the world and this has been the part where i've been trying to trying to parse out exactly what it is because i think it constitutes almost a a, a unique emerging new political ideology mm -hmm. that doesn't fall cleanly into pre-existing categories um it's it's not globalist but it's not nationalist either it's um it's like it's not liberal but it's not conservative it's sort of vaguely, maybe libertarian nationalists might be like the lowest, res like from a really low resolution, kind of something like that, maybe like kind of a socially liberal, fiscally conservative sort of thing. Um, but they have specific issues. There's specific um, uh, uh, prominent tech executives, uh, founders sit on boards, venture capitalists, um, and then it branches out kind of into media as well. I would put someone like Patrick Bet David very much along this th these sorts of lines. These guys who are independently wealthy um, have uh, they're very experienced within the system, um, but they also have a deep understanding that this is not simply a matter of oh we need to elect the right people. There's serious um, foundational fatal flaws within the existing uh, power structures, and that there's I no think adults. I In think I would describe it as like a populist Americana. Yes. Yes. I, 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 think I, I said a... kind of an Americanist. They have like a an Americanist where they're not strictly nationalist, but they're like, they say America should exist. They yeah. want America to exist. They want to be proud to be an American. Right. They want to live in a country that embodies the values that historically have been associated with Americans. They, they want uh, a free market. They speak of these things very glowingly, things like a free market, and they want to have strong borders. They want a strong military. They want to uh, um, protect national interests, invest in manufacturing here at home, take care of Americans before taking care of foreigners. These are like consistent themes throughout the stuff that they're talking about. Yet at the same time, they're also like um, they on the social issues, they're more likely to be kind of like like whatever, like like. Those things don't matter. Let's focus on these matters here that are that are most pressing. So they're mostly driven by, I'd say, economic interests and um, uh, they're they're big uh, China cynics, China skeptics. I don't know if China hawk is necessarily the correct term um, because they are they do have a tendency to be very anti-war um, right. in the sort of liber in the sort of libertarian sense, kind of like defensive wars only. Um, so they're very they're anti. World Economic Forum. They're anti, uh, they're very pro Bukele, they're pro Malay. Um, but they're also like definitely liberals. Like they come from the they're 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 steeped in liberalism. They speak of democracy as a positive thing. Mm. Um, so they're 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 sort of hard to categorize. And a lot of people see them as um, I mean, there's the, the doomers that are inevitably going to see them as compromised in one way or the other. Uh, but they're like one thing that, that Vivek says consistently that's very interesting to me. He keeps hammering this point home, home over and over and over again that uh, the, uh, the people we elect 
to office have a primary duty to the citizens of the United States, not mm-hmm. to another country. You're right. This is one of his talking points. You can see, it's funny, you can see the tech speak in the way that he comports himself. So he takes all of his talking points and he distills them down into like a headline. Mm-hmm. So he's going to give you the headline, then he's going to give you the tweet, then he's going to give you the long form explanation. Um, so it's like he's sending an email to you, he's sending you a tweet, he's giving you the long form uh, conversation. But the thing that he really hones in on when he distills it down to like a single sentence, it's the people we elect to represent us owe an owe a duty to us, to American citizens, first and foremost, which is a that's an interesting thing to hone in on, to use as your it's a very carefully crafted statement that says a lot without naming certain particular things. So in a in a in a environment where dual loyalty might be a question. Um, he's making it very clear what his what his stance on a dual loyalty question would be. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so this is there's a there's a thing called the Californian ideology, which was something that was being talked about in the 90s. And if you think about these guys, a lot of them were coming of age in the 90s. So they were they were in their either late teens, 20s, maybe into their 30s, the older ones. So to them, the 90s was and they're overwhelmingly in tech. So they remember this time of of great optimism, peace, prosperity, you know, the culture's banging, you know, everything is like the nineties were, there was the stuff going on with, with uh, uh, Clinton and the white house, but there was still a sense of, of like, we have a country, mm-hmm. like we have a country where we're all Americans. We live here, we have our disagreements, but at the end of the day, we believe in our country and we want to live in our country. And um, also a, like a, a, the, the number go up sense, like, the stock market is booming. Everything's booming. Great innovations, fantastic uh, technological advancements are happening. We're going to live in the future soon. Big obsession with sci-fi. You have uh, uh, Star Wars being re-released then. And uh, this is the sort of the cultural milieu that they came of age in. And then from their perspective, everything kind of went off the deep end after 9-11, you have 9-11, then you have the housing crisis, then you have um, all the race riots, and then you have Trump, and then you have Russiagate, and then you have yeah, 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 yeah. So in their minds, it's not that they want to go back to the 90s. It's that they feel like the 90s was the last time that we had a country. Mm-hmm. And they want to have a country because they want to have somewhere to build. Because they've got big shit they want to build. Like, they want to go to Mars. They want to, they, to them, um, we can technologically develop our way out of anything. Obviously, I don't agree with that premise per se, but I think that this this the perspective that informs that is 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 fairly naive. I think a lot of them, I would say, seem politically naive. They they're they're kind of getting to the point where some of us might have been. I don't know. Uh, speaking for myself, I'll say eight to ten years ago, where I was kind of like, man, we just need to get we need to have this constitutional government. We need to get back to the founding principles. You know, we need to have a free market. Got to get the government out of the way. Look how corrupt it is. Ah, no one likes Congress. Uh, you know, and and we need to come back together. We don't need to have all these people trying to divide us. Mm-hmm. They're very much in that frame of mind. Back when Glenn Beck was still on Fox. Yes, yes. So they're they're they come from California, so they have that that sort of uh, sort of hippieish libertarian live and let live. Um, you know, let's we're going to code in the morning and go surfing in the afternoon kind of kind of mentality. But then it's also paired with a um, a, a very anti-libertarian like we need to crack down on crime. We need to close our borders. We need to build a strong a strong military. We need to have we need to have government investment in in America, not not uh, the rest of the world. We can't be the world's policemen. Mm-hmm. We can't be trying to 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 um uh we 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 can't rule the world if we can't rule ourselves. So it's very non-libertarian economically. It's much more I don't know mercantilist, uh, nationalistic kind of. Mm-hmm. So I think I think populist Americana probably probably captures it pretty well. Well, I don't see any reason to continue this. I think I think we've we I think we've covered a lot. I don't. 
one thing I told you at, at the beginning, I, I don't want you to be repeating a whole bunch of stuff and mm. we could just dive into all the stuff you've already said, because a lot of the questions that are popping in my head is like, yeah, Matt's already said that in this podcast and he's already said that there and he's already said that <laughs> like my audience wants to hear it. They can go listen to King Pilled or they can go to uh, PayPal friend or fed at two bit podcast and go listen to the Pete Quinones show when you were on there. There's a bunch of places that they can go to listen to you uh, talk in more depth. But I think that we gave a good outline and kind of your thought process getting from the generational kind of ideas into what the PayPal mafia is and where they came from, how they developed. Do you have anything else you want to, you think you need to say? Um, I would say that if there, this is essentially one, um, uh, there's, it, I guess kind of what we're seeing to flesh the whole picture out is a, is a, is the coming together of a coalition of different interests that, they're, the thing that they have in common is essentially this fundamental populist Americana sort of uh, of thread. One of them, would, the, the other one would be the first coalition would be the Silicon Valley group. Then there would be the Project 2025 people. Then there would be like the um, uh, American com commercial banking apparatus. And this is something that Tom Luongo and uh, Phil Gibson at uh, uh, Quiet Parts Out Loud um, Substack that they brought onto my radar. As soon as I started talking about this stuff, people started saying, hey, you need to listen to Tom Luongo. And um, essentially he's making the case that there's there's a, a revolt happening within the uh, American banking system to basically, uh, to make America financially sovereign, where the Fed is no longer going to be the central bank of the world. The Fed is going to be the central bank of America. And breaking breaking America off from Europe um, like, like fiscally. So this is something happening within the, the American commercial banking apparatus. Then you have the project 2025, like, which is like American conservative NGOs that are, um, forming around this new right approach. This, like, how do we actually take mega and make mega a thing that can, can, um, sustain power. And it's being led by heritage foundation, Michael Anton Hillsdale, TPUSA with Charlie Kirk, a number of these characters. And then, the Silicon Valley uh, technocrats, essentially. And this is, th they're beginning to coalesce around a lot of the same ideas, which have to do with dis like dismantling the bureaucratic state, protecting our borders, um, uh, protecting our interests from foreign actors. Uh, these are all like the things that are really combining um, together to form this coalition. And I think on its own, each of these individual nodes likely wouldn't be able to, um, uh, successfully stand up to the regime. But once you get all three of these coalitions together, that's a substantial amount of, of institutional power, money, um, uh, uh, messaging capability, et cetera, et cetera, that I think what we're seeing is a legitimate um, uh, transition to what the, the, the future of America is going to look like. <clears throat> cool. All right. Plug away, man. Uh, King Pilled on YouTube uh, and on all the podcatchers. Uh, I have to say, if you're on the um, Apple Podcasts, I can't get the, the 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 thumbnail to update to our new logo, so it'll look like an old logo, but it's 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 still the that's still us. We're still updating it. And then uh, Twitter is where I dump the most of my thoughts uh, at Real King Pilled. Uh, and also, when is this episode coming out? Uh, it'll probably be two weeks. Okay, so by the time this one comes out. I'll have uh, had the same conversation or not the same conversation, but I'll have been discussing this subject on uh, academic agent on uh, YouTube. And so you can go there and then there's a whole bunch of episodes over the last dozen or so on the King Pilled YouTube channel where we flesh all of this stuff out a lot more. So um, if for whatever reason, someone feels like we haven't answered all their questions in this episode, then that's where you'd go. Well, maybe we'll do a Q and a session. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to do it. All right. Other, you, uh, otherwise then I don't, go live because screw that yeah. that's a lot of pressure man <laughs> it is yeah <laughs> all right